In our series, The World After Coronavirus, today we have with us David Chart. David is the Dean of the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development here at Boston University. And we're going to ask him what he thinks the future of education might look like in a post-COVID world. I want to step back for a minute and, and comment on the notion that um, that I think most of the world has grown familiar with, that education happens in places, right? In buildings, in schools, we call them schools, I think, uh, globally, um, when in fact learning happens everywhere. It happens on buses, it happens in homes, it happens um, on uh, in playgrounds and fields. It's the formal formalization of education that in some ways both interrupts learning Right, it says these things are not important and these things are. And I think it's important to keep that in mind because when the disruption happens to formal education, learning continues, right? Then the question is, is how can we also have some of the high priority formal education continue as well? So I think uh, we've got now, we have to begin to think about how, how would we do that? I mean, how, how could we do that? in a way that would continue to advance learning in what we know is the best way to learn, right? With real trial and error, kind of fast failure and going back to the drawing board, and trying things again. So I think that is a, I think a precious opportunity for us. Thinking of the post COVID world, you know, all across the world, not just here, there are um, young people and, and there are teachers who have had a spring like never before and who will probably have a summer like never before. Mm. And then at some point they will return to schools. How might they have changed because of this experience? I think their expectations are going to be different. I think their expectations are going to be higher um, of what, when we're together, when we make the effort to be in the same place together, I think the expectation of the kinds of things you would uh, accomplish in that space, sh if, if they don't, they should go up, right? We should not tolerate um, uh, just listening to a talking head um, when we're together, because I can do that here, right? I don't need to be with you in a room. How might teachers be changed by this experience? It's hard to predict exactly. I would like to believe that teachers will learn some things about themselves that they didn't think they could accomplish. And because of that, they'll come back to the, um, back to schools with a whole new sort of outlook about what they, how, how precious that time is and how it could be used differently and how they could engage kids um, with one another differently. I also think it will change how we prepare teachers, quite honestly. I mean, there are, you know, coming from a college where that's partly what we do, we're looking already at ways to think about how uh, our teachers can use um, these virtual systems to spend time with students and learn the kind of tools of the trade. I, I think it could have a kind of a revolutionary change. All the, all the parents who are trying to figure out uh, how to uh, work with their children all day. Do you think that might lead to a new respect for educators, for schools, for teachers, and, and what they contribute? I hope, I hope there's a renewed respect. Um, I also think, you know, that there, there may be a change in expectations on the part of parents and families about schools. And, and a little bit of pressure from them would not be a bad thing either. Um, but I think now having higher expectations um, for what good learning, good teaching and learning looks like may, may be one of the most important outcomes of this. Your worst fear? Well, uh, you know, my worst fear is that the recession will be so, um, so deep that um, state governments and federal governments uh, around the world will find themselves in a position where they can't fully fund education.